Hello, welcome everyone. I can see people joining in. This is Vishal here. I'm part of Invenio LSI team and uh, I'm going to be here introducing the team and the company and uh, talking a little bit more about what is the plan for today. So I will give another minute for people to join in and uh, I think we can start after. <clears throat> Sounds good. Excellent. Oh, okay. I see a lot more people running in pretty quickly. Okay. Uh, thank, thanks, everyone. Thanks for thanks for today. Thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule. I know it's uh, for for the West Coast. It's actually the the first half of the day for. Us here in the East Coast, uh, it's right back in the middle of the day. So, uh, but you know, we have found out that this is when uh, it, this is actually the best time for everybody to join in. And uh, from our experience of having so many webinars in these last two years, that uh, you know, this was the right time. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, you know, we basically wanted to, uh, you know, come forward and talk about how analytics is actually helping our client how it is shaping up their strategy and how can we basically present the same to you uh, so you can you know use analytics use the data that you have to enhance the citizens lives because ultimately that's the goal for every uh, uh, you know important person in the organization all the decision makers that we've spoken to so that's the plan for today that's the topic uh, we have a lot of uh, content we have a lot of important and uh, uh, i would say uh, relevant content which is applicable in today's time uh, which is very uncertain uh, but data is actually your best friend and we'll see how will that help you take better decisions and move forward with your strategy uh, just before we start there are a few things that i wanted to cover uh, which are helpful to you in in this webinar while it goes on uh, you want to move to the next slide please Okay, thank you. So yeah, uh, you know, so please, you know, focus all on on the webinar because we'll be sending you the recording. Uh, you know, please ask questions anytime. Uh, the whole format of this webinar is going to be it's it's based on interaction. So we have our, our experts today on the panel. We have Todd Gardner, who is the industry value expert, and uh, we also have Abir, who is actually a data scientist and has worked with public sector customers. Uh, firsthand. Uh, again, both the panelists, both the both the uh, speakers today are uh, veterans in their and in, in public sector and uh, no public sector in in and out. So please ask them questions. Please clarify all your doubts. Uh, I think this is the right forum. This is the right uh, time to do that. Again, we will take all the questions even offline. But uh, completely feel free to post your questions on the section which says questions on the right hand side of the panel. So I hope you will be able to spot that. It's a small pointer which says question. So click on that. You will see a box open. Please post your questions there and uh, we'll be able to get those uh, and we'll answer them during the webinar or uh, at the end of the webinar. So we have a few minutes left at the end just to answer questions uh, as well. Uh, again, you know, this whole thing is based on views. So please share your views. We would like to know more about it. Uh, we keep hearing our customers in improving what we are doing and this topic that we are going to present today is actually based on something that we keep hearing from our customers so thank you uh, next one please all right we have the team here and i will let them introduce themselves uh i'm gonna go to the next slide and do you want uh Todd, do you want to start sure thing Hey everybody, um, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here with you today. My name is Todd Gardner. Uh, as Vishal said, I'm an industry and solution advisor and you don't get that kind of title by being a new kid on the block. So um, I, I've been around uh, for a bit, uh, 20 years of my career as a public servant uh, in the tax administration uh, arenas, as well as uh, social services in the child support enforcement domain. Um, where we had a lot of interaction with uh, benefit administration agencies, uh, as well as uh, in the regulatory as IT director for the Florida Department of Health, um, where we primarily built regulatory systems for licensure and uh, certification and 
um, renewal of those licenses by medical professionals in the state. Um, the last 10 years uh, worked uh, with SAP as a global solution manager, focusing specifically on uh, public sector as an industry vertical, and then within public sector, um, more refined to uh, regulatory administration, those things that, um, uh, that we'll talk about today, uh, both at the municipal, the state, and the federal level. Um, primarily in the North America region. So I'm um, really looking forward to sharing some thoughts and, um, and hearing from you as well as we proceed today. Excellent. Well, we're lucky to have you, Todd. Thank you. Abir, you want to go next? Thanks, Todd. Uh, hi, this is Abir. Um, I, am a, I have around 18 years of experience. I have background in statistics. I am a, and, and I have background in computer science. I am a master's of data science. Uh, and I have uh, a background in helping clients to gain distinct advantage among their peers using the power of data. Uh, I try to combine data, data and business and statistics uh, all at one place and try to make sure that uh, to find out, in fact, any hidden truth that is not always visible to the client and, uh, and you know, make sure that data can give you some uh, some tangible insight into your into your business problem, which you were aware of, or you might not be even aware of. So, so that's me. Hi. Wow. Okay, that's 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 a great uh, profile, Abhi. Uh, thanks, thanks for joining and sharing your thoughts mm -hmm. today. Uh, before we start, I just wanted to basically cover of uh, a little bit about uh, who we are as a company, and uh, we will see that in the in the coming slide. And again. Uh, Please feel free to ask questions that I mentioned during any part of uh, you know the webinar. Uh, this is not a sales pitch. This is not about who we are. We basically want to talk to you about what we see in the industry, how data can help you, so on and so forth. Uh, we will go and see a little bit about us. Again, you know we are uh, here for quite some time now, three decades, more than that. Uh, we are premier SAP Global Partners. That's that's a partnership that we have uh, again from the time that the company started. Uh, it's a global company. We are, you know, we are spread across everywhere. Uh, again, these days, anyways, location does not matter. Uh, you know, the client problems is, is I think, what we focus on. Uh, and we see a lot of patterns and a lot of similarities in what the client is asking for or what their problem areas are. So again, uh, you know, that, that's, uh, we have a very global perspective of what's happening around the world. But again, uh, we are very North America focused. US, Canada is, are, are the chunk of where all our clients are. So you will see that in the next slide where we have a little bit of uh, logos put up there. Uh, absolutely, thank you. Uh, so again, you know, we are spread across 60% of all the SAP implementations that have happened here in the US uh, with public sector clients on SAP have happened by LSI Consulting. So that's, that's a great number. We are pretty proud of that. Again, that just shows the length and breadth of we understanding the public sector, we understanding the regulatory market, we understanding states, cities, municipalities, how it functions, what the expectations are. Uh, a few prominent names, a few ones, uh, again, all these uh, logos that you see are all active contracts that we have. Uh, state of Nevada, State of Hawaii, uh, you know, uh, County of San Bernardino, Prince George's County, all these are the customer base, all these are the customers that we have and that we work with. City of Palo Alto, City of San Diego. So again, it's a, it's a wide list and, uh, you know, from East Coast to West Coast and everything in between. So, uh, you know, we you will see that in the you know in the following slides uh, which will come up by Todd and Abir and you know how do we help our customers on a day-to-day -day basis so that was that's all I wanted to say and now I can pass it on to the real experts uh, that's Todd mm -hmm. thank you sir thank you all right Abir let's go ahead and um, roll to the next slide so today we're going to accomplish a few things. Uh, Vishal touched on it, and I think it's really important um, to understand that really what we're going to try to do, we're going to talk about um, solutions. Uh, we're going to stay away from product-centric uh, discussions. Of course, um, they, they will come uh, into play as you're entertaining and beginning to develop your digital transformation and analytical strategy. Um, but today we're going to um, provide a little overview of the market and what we're seeing. Uh, we'll have a couple of uh, case studies that Abir will demonstrate. 
Um, we're going to do an interview, and this will be sprinkled in uh, throughout the webinar, and touch on you know a couple of key areas that are certainly top of mind as a project management professional, uh, and many of uh, you have continuing education requirements uh, that occur periodically, and I'm constantly attending um, uh, online events and webinars and participating in discussions with uh, customers, and this topic is absolutely, um, if not the most popular, um, at the at, at near the top of that popularity list. So um, we're we're going to stay focused on those uh, actions and uh, that strategy for the discussion today. Um, we'll have some Q and A, uh, as Vishal said. We'd love for you to enter your questions uh, in the questions panel on the side panel. And then we'll summarize and wrap up and um, uh, send you after the meeting is over the uh, recording. So you'll have it with you. Let's go ahead to the next slide, Abir. So um, we're, again, we welcome you to um, how can analytics help government agencies on their digital journey and improve citizens' lives. Um, that's really a, a the topic of today, and I know the title is long, but as many of you can appreciate, this area is quite broad, and data usage and data science really is at the top of mind for many uh, organizations uh, today. Um, it, those sources that I mentioned, and one of the things that I always enjoy uh, in attending webinars is hearing the speakers provide some of their uh, sources of information that they use to help keep them abreast of the industry and the challenges that are being faced by the industry. Um, over the years, I've kind of refined down to a couple of those sources. I'd be happy to uh, share with them. One of them uh, is the uh, Center for Excellence in Public Leadership uh, through the uh, George Washington University. If you're interested, we'll provide that link um, with the follow-up material. Um, but really, the um, one of the um, most um, interesting things that um, that I've come across in preparing for the webinar today was an article that was published back in 2018 that included a Forrester report that said the study uh, reports that up to 73% of company data goes unused for analytics. And then the study goes on to say, and that's despite the fact that more companies are talking about big data, using technology to capture more data, and acknowledging the value of this information. So even with the, um, the top of mind nature that um, uh, this topic has, there's still a lot of room for improvement. And there are a lot of things that organizations can do to help bring that figure down so that in your analytical strategy, not only are you um, uh, able to uh, manage the massive amount of data that's being created in the environment uh, today, and, and that's true even if we eliminate the aspect of sensor-driven um, data. A, a lot of what organizations are, ha are grappling with from a, a data source and a data usage is, is how do they incorporate the mass amounts of sensor data that is being created uh, as we move along um, in their processes. And so um, part of what uh, Abir will show you today um, relates to that aspect of uh, organizational and, and government um, conducting of their uh, tasks and duties, um, but also uh, the other operational uh, data that you're creating on a daily basis, as well as the data that citizens and your customers are providing to you um, as they interact with your solutions and as they interact with the portals that you have available to afford them um, uh, their 24 seven access to you and the transactions and the requirements that they're are required to satisfy uh, for you. So I've got my uh, partner, uh, Abir uh, Chakraborty, uh, on the line today. And um, 
uh, Beer just happens to be, as he said in his opening, a data scientist and has worked in the field of data analytics for many years. But most importantly, um, he's worked on the ground with organizations around the globe to help them improve their data usage and analytics strategy. Um, Abir is gonna illustrate a couple of use cases and then we'll have some questions that I'll pose to Abir and we would love to have you chime in with your observations and questions as well. Um, we'll touch on topics like uh, security, uh, open source. We know many of budgets are constrained and organizations uh, may not be ready for a full blown digital transformation engagement but they want to use their data in a more efficient way and they want to enable the data um, that they're maintaining and that they potentially have access to um, uh, in the future that they don't have access to today to help ensure that their operations are running as effectively and efficiently as possible and the stakeholders that uh, receive the benefit of those operations are satisfied um, with that topic. So um, also throughout the presentation today, we're gonna have uh, sprinkle in a couple of interactive polls. We'd really encourage you to participate in those. We're very interested in your, um, in your feedback there. Um, and so with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Abir. And uh, the first use case that um, we're gonna talk about really um, covers a broad spectrum of um, of requirements and it focuses on the emergency use scenario and how data can be brought about to help organizations and this is uh, this case involves multiple organizations which is relevant for almost every municipal customer and um, uh, colleague that uh, that I've dealt with in my experience where um, to accomplish a particular objective, Many times it requires coordination between multiple government organizations, such as in wildfire suppression, where local and state and federal resources are brought to bear to help ensure that assets, uh, both people and things, are being leveraged appropriately so that um, the uh, fires can be attacked in the most efficient way possible and, and literally lives uh, saved. So, uh, Abir, I'll turn it over to you and get us started with that. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Todd. And thanks thanks a lot for, uh, thanks for everyone for coming in and, and listening to us. Okay, so what we see here right now in the screen uh, is is an orchestra. An orchestra which is comprised of a wonderful sound of a single instrument. But when these single instrument combine together, they makes a symphony, a symphony of beautiful music. What you're gonna see here today is a symphony and a symphony which is, which is which the output of it is emergency management to make sure we have a quick and confident decision on any emergency that we have in our hand. I'm gonna now show you uh, what we have built. Okay, so what we see here, first of all, the data. Uh, we, have, uh, we have first gathered data on wildfire. We have gathered data from Twitter feeds. We have gathered data from different other sources. Primarily, we have categorized data into basically two parts. One part is where data is easy to acquire. For example, Twitter data, or for example, the data of the current organization. It's our, in our show, we can easily get it and we are fairly confident of, of the data, the quality of data that we are getting. Then there is another set of data, which is, which is hard to acquire and not, not easy to manage. Also, there might not be even there a plan to get that data to our show and to acquire that data. Here we have we have combined data from multiple sources. So we have combined data from Twitter. We have combined data from uh, from California.gov website, Sierra.gov website, and we have also combined data from various other federal sources, like for example, for example, forestry services and so on. With that, I'm going to now show you what's going on here. So every 
every red dot as you see here is a, is a fire that is being that is raging on and a fire is burning across and the data that we have is how much acres is currently being burning is burning this data is in the year 2020 and this gives you the whole year's data so so whatever data we see here is, is from from 2020 year and all the fires that are being there we have data which says how much of acres are is burning in that fire as you can see if you hover our mouse on top of every one of them now now we're going to bring in data from various sources one by one let's bring in the first source of data which is the federal rescue data we have we have got their data and we have used their equipments specifically the helicopter that is being used to douse it douse a fire so if i click in here as we can see now now it shows us for every fire the data which we have obtained from twitter how many equipments are being used these are helicopter data that is being used so as we can see here this fire is was attended by 20 helicopters this fire was attended by one helicopter and so on for the other ones similarly if we if we now i'm going to show you if i bring in the state department help or, or state department apparatus if you click here we're going to now see all the state department uh, data that is being fed in and these are basically how many people are being currently in, they, those were involved in here so we had around 53 uh, crews that were that were dous dousing the fire similarly now we're going to combine all of it and we're going to see one in one source how does it look like so it looks like this where we have a few fire where we have only state department working on few fire we have both federal and state working on and maybe it currently doesn't show but it could be possible that only federal department is working on one of the rescue now what's the point in having all this this is the place where we have combined all the data and we have given an given a graphical representation to let someone to manage this fire they can see how many where the fire is going on they can see how many federal rescue federal rescue operations in the form of helicopters are involved and how many state departments uh, uh, personnel are 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 taking are taking on those fire we could also include data from ems data from fire engines we can also include data from ambulance and so on if we assume all of these services have any rfid device involved in it we can also see their movement across from one fire to another fire this is really great because it allows us to see all the assets at one place and it also allow us to allocate assets depending on what our requirement is so far so good human are doing all this but what about machines how does they come into picture what we have taken this one step further we have picked up historical fires we have picked we have picked up historical federal rescue uh, equipments that were involved and we have also picked up fed state level rescue rescue in, uh, uh, machineries that were involved then we let it give it give it to the machine and created a statistical model that what that model did is that model created a machine learning algorithm which allows us to predict what the machine thinks if a fire comes up what the machine thinks what should be the equipment that should be used like if i if i turn off this uh, state level rescue off and if i just have the federal level rescue equipments here as we can see some of the fires didn't had any uh, any federal helicopters being attended at now if i now turn on to enable prediction i would see that there are some fire which are big enough which which are where the wind is blowing blowing in a certain direction that we think that that fire might go increase even more with that keeping that into mind machine has predicted that we should dispatch some 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 sort of uh, helicopters to some some of the fires now there is a back end in the back end there is a there is a machine learning algorithm which has been created which uses statistical data to profile all the previous fires and creates model which predicts number of uh, number of equipment that need to be that need to be dispatched in it also uses one more factor which is what is the nearest existing helicopters are that has been assigned to a fire it looks at it and it sees if that particular helicopter is sitting idle there or not 
if there is not much wind going on or if the fire has already been controlled at what it then does is it looks at the nearby uh, equipments and it tries to first allocate those equipments into the nearest fire that is being raging on if it can it it does that otherwise we have an option to deploy more uh, equipment in 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 in, the, in this fire now if i go back to the state level here are the state level rescue that is going on now i can turn on the prediction mode for this and i can see that this fire was not being attended by any crews crew it's saying that we should send at least two crews there because previously a fire of this magnitude with all sort of other kpis taken into consideration statistically there were more or less two crews that they were able to handle this so this is the power of data where we have not only combined everything we have also not only given a dashboard where agents can take cognitive decision quickly we have also given the power of machine where machine can work and it can give predict what should be what should be how should we should handle this now some of us may might be thinking that how we can make this even more generic now the base of the mathematics is still the same but application can differ for example we can use this for a power outage scenario we can use this for a plumbing leaks we can even use it for a storm where we or some kind of a hurricane where we know the path and the trajectory of the of the storm that's going to go in which way and we can combine all this data and predict and create a model that can not only show you the data which is existing which is currently being going on we also show you the data which which might happen at later course so it can trace the path for you and it can also predict you how many equipments that need to be dispatched so combining everything together we have we, we have made this scenario available now some of the some of the states specifically california have do share their data between each other but we have from my past experience we have seen that there are dispatch unit for example police has a dispatch unit for example ams has, ems has a dispatch unit ambulances have a dispatch unit but they non sometimes they work in in silos which means uh, there's no coordination between them and that could be a very this could be a very good scenario and 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 with california's uh, legislation, legislation that they have we could we could have have some kind of a law or some kind of a policy where we could let this data to be combined and by combining this data we can really create a symphony where we can really solve and save lives by acting pretty quickly and by making decisive and confident decision on what should go where and how it should be tackled at finally the most important part is to identify data that matters to us and to matter to what's being looked at what is being solved at and that's the that's the most important and challenging question that that we think need to be looked at with that i'll finish off my uh, part in the use case thank you let, abir yeah, thanks thanks hey, for that. abir just stay right here i want to make a comment um uh, about that uh, that last point that you raised and um for our listeners um and i can speak from personal experience as a revenue ex uh, administrator at um uh, at, at a revenue agency, um, one time uh, we we were initiating, and I, I worked uh, in the enforcement realm. So all of the investigative and audit resources that um, uh, that we had were seeking ways to become more effective with closing the tax gap. Basically, we, and everybody understands what that is. Essentially, we wanted to improve voluntary compliance. And many times you do that through increased enforcement. Um, we identified a resource, a data resource, even within our own organization, that because of specific statutory language with regard to that uh, data resource, we could not use it uh, as a data element in our enforcement um, uh, campaigns and strategies. However, we knew that this data could be uh, very useful. So um, it, it was uh, uh, the so what we decided to do with um, uh, organizational leadership's approval is to literally uh, recommend a policy and or a change to the law that would allow us to leverage that internal data uh, ourselves for this particular purpose. Now the key thing to note in that is 
um, that that doesn't happen overnight. And so the encouragement to our audience who are contemplating a, uh, a data analytics strategy and you identify sources of information that you know could provide value to you in that strategy, but you don't have access to today, start now uh, gaining access and uh, discover the avenues that are available to you um, for gaining that access. Um, Abir mentioned it, the um, California Wildlife Management Cooperative Agreement is a relatively large um, uh, legislative act that specifically allows for many federal uh, agencies, and it, you'd think that it, it might just be wildfire, but no, it's several to um, interact with the state of California toward the goal of wildfire su suppression and prevention. So the lesson learned and um, is don't just assume that a data source is not available to you, um, explore the options for gaining access to that data. And the reality is in government, sometimes those kinds of things take a little while to accomplish, um, but nonetheless, they can prove to be very valuable in uh, as you begin your data analytics strategy. Sylvia, do we have any questions at, at this point? Looks like we're good. Okay. All right. So Abir, let's move into the um, uh, the next use case that you have. Uh, and this use case is um, more in the tax administration and regulatory administration um, framework and uh, related to how can an organization, and this really goes um, beyond just the tax administration, but how can organizations use data to help um, better inform their operational decisions daily? Um, that information many times can be uh, additional data about the, uh, the entities or the citizens and taxpayers themselves, uh, or about groups of taxpayers or citizens, if we're talking about a permitting or licensing or um, recovery or enforcement type of uh, activity. So, um, Abir, let's talk about that. Sure. Thanks, Todd. Okay. So, next use case of mine is a use, and and this use case is for tax fraud and behavioral insight. The outcome of this use case is to reduce delinquency value and increase collection data. So the software that I've used for this is uh, is open source Python, and the front end is done in SAP SAP Analytics for Cloud, and the data for this is comes from various different sources. Data for this hey, comes from. Here. I apologize. Let me interrupt you there for just a moment. I forgot a very important thing. I, I wanted to include a poll at this point. So what I'm going to do is launch the first poll that we have, and the poll will pop up on your screen. And um, we will really encourage you to answer, what is the most challenging aspect of an effective data analytics strategy? If you'd select one of those options, we'll give you a few seconds. All right. Hopefully everybody had an opportunity to uh, interact with the poll and we appreciate that very much. Uh, and Abir, sorry to interrupt you there, but please continue. Thanks, uh, thanks Todd. Okay, so uh, in terms of data source, we have data from internal uh, tax, tax uh, software. We have also used uh, external macroeconomic data, for example, uh, GDP. We have also used uh, CPI, uh, which is the inflation in index. We have we have used uh, Brent oil price. We have used the spot price for Henry gas, and we have also used data from Moody's.
Now, Moody's data was important because we wanted to understand how does uh, behavior of a taxpayer works. Taking all that data and combining it together, what we did is we created a, a risk segmentation. This is important because we want to understand the behavior of a taxpayer. I'm going to now show you the output of it. So here is this. Uh, we we have we have used uh, we have around seventy four thousand five hundred ninety seven tax unique taxpayers. These taxpayers are created by us as a dummy data with our experience in in in, in tax management uh, softwares and. Once that is done, we have then given it to a model where uh, clean data, well, a lot of things has gone after acquiring the data and giving it to the model. But in a nutshell, once that data is clean data is fed into the model, the model then creates a mathematical representation of every taxpayer in terms of their cash flow related risk profile and different market regimes that has been also fed in to create three groups of taxpayers. One of them is low risk taxpayers. One of them is high risk taxpayer and the other one is the medium risk taxpayer. When we gave it to the model, we saw that around 90% of them were green, which means they were less risky. Now risk is defined uh, according to their uh, according to the cash flow, obviously, and it's also defined according to the attributes that they had. We had historical data of around eight years and eight years of their data, what they did how they behave with the, with the tax agency and everything everything we could capture in uh, in terms of their their kpi attributes once that is done we 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 had as you can see in the screen right now this is the whole representation of the 74000 taxpayer and any typical uh, tax agency would have a similar noted, similar kind of a place where all the taxpayers are similar they know some of them are risky some of them are more risky or less or, or the other but it's a bit difficult to find a specific taxpayer and it's like finding a needle in a haystack. What we then did is we went a little bit more further in and we segregated the data out. We, we, we make sure that we fill in all the specific uh, low risk, medium risk and the high risk taxpayer into our respective buckets. And by doing this, we actually have uh, reduced our, uh, our, our data in a quite bigger sense. 90% of them are, are green, which means they are low risk taxpayer. So I might not be too much interested with them other than just, just looking in general what they behave. What I'll be interested in is the other, other bracket, which is around like 9% uh, of the total taxpayer. I would look at them and I would make sure that I, I observe their movement. For example, if some of their attribute change and that makes them even more riskier, I'll be raising a flag. I'll be raising a flag and I want to understand what's going on with that taxpayer. Uh, I'm going to show you uh, in, in the next few couple of slides how that whole thing works. Now, once we had this low risk, medium risk and high risk taxpayer, we want to dig in more because we want to, our idea was to create, to, to, pro, to, and to provide some kind of a tool which would help the, the, the tax department to formalize some specific tailor-made uh, uh, policies or law targeting some specific taxpayer. Now, we wanted to understand where does the high risk taxpayer comes from? This was an example where we had tax, we, where the taxpayer are actually, they, they were like a co-owner like of, of, the, of the companies which are there in that given country. So they would need to know where are these taxpayer coming from for a high risk taxpayer bracket and so on for a medium risk and a low risk tax bracket. We also had, they also are doing quite big business in, in oil and gas. So we wanted to understand how does oil and gas play into uh, categorizing a taxpayer into a low risk or a medium risk or a high risk taxpayer, which we have depicted here. And picking up these, we can we can we might define some kind of a uh, policy or some kind of a uh, law so that we target some specific taxpayer who are maybe in a high risk tax bracket. It could be also possible that taxpayer are finding difficult some sort of forms and sometimes we feel that the taxpayer is not filing on time because they, they are finding it difficult to comprehend the form. So that could be also a scenario where although a taxpayer is really nice, but they are sitting in a medium risk or a high risk tax bracket. And, and that could be kind of a, a, a 
kind of an outlier you can say in the whole picture and that need to be also identified and our main aim would be to educate the taxpayer so that they understand everything in and out uh, abir i have a question for you sure yeah. Um, uh, one of the things that I've observed uh, in working in the industry for a long time, uh, whether we're talking about a transactional implementation or an analytical uh, implementation for a customer um, or myself, you know, as an implementer, um, is the importance of involving subject matter experts um, in your formulation of your data strategy and your um, data analytics strategy. The people in your organization are, if not the most valuable, if they are, they are the most valuable resource that you have. And so I want to encourage everyone to don't not only say that you're going to involve subject matter experts and the people in your organization who have the intrinsic knowledge and the experience with the processes, but stand behind the involvement of these resources in your project from start to finish. It is amazing the difference that is made when you have that type of involvement from the people in your organization who are carrying out the tasks on a daily basis that you're responsible for um, in the formulation of your strategy and then in the actual engagements that you pursue uh, to accomplish that strategy. I, I just want to, I can't say enough how important it is um, to have that involvement. And I've seen it myself, where at the beginning of a project, you pay lip service to it and you have some statements in your contract documents about it. But when it comes to executing that, um, it sometimes and a lot of times is a challenge. So ensure that you've got a, a good support mechanism to ensure that your subject matter expertise within your organization is involved from start to finish. And uh, Abir, if I could, I wanted to ask you a, a question while we're here in this area. One of the things that um, uh, that can, has been a challenge, I was uh, had, had the privilege of working with a state customer several years ago around a retirement and pension benefit uh, system. One of the key requirements that they had was that they wanted employees to be able through their online portal to conduct estimates of their pension or retirement benefit. Yeah, we, we call it what if analysis sometimes and uh, the ability to project and calculate an estimate based on a variety of factors. Well, you can imagine in a retirement scenario for a given individual, they may have changed jobs three or four times and this was a state government retirement so you had employees, for example, teachers who may have moved between jurisdictions, each with their own contribution rates. And so the churn that had to occur in order to calculate the estimate that is then published through the portal um, is very extensive. And this was a, a difficult technological challenge to be able to allow a citizen to request such an estimate online and be able to return a result immediately. Um, can you talk a little bit about how technology can help in uh, those types of deep and uh, high volume uh, analytics that are there to provide uh, what if scenario results uh, for internal and external stakeholders and um, those uh, that, that type of scenario? Yeah, sure. Uh... If I take this as two part uh, in terms of your question, number one is how, how how quickly the data could be churned in, and the second part is the what if scenario. Uh, I'll first take the the speed aspect of and 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 the scale uh, of data. Uh, well, uh, these mathematical uh, uh, equations or theorems that I have used here, they were already there well before 1960s, but the computers that time that's used by by um, Mr. Turning is uh, to, to, to break Enigma in World War One was uh, what was primitive. What has changed since then is the speed of computers. Equations remain the same, mathematical theorem remain the same, but the power of computer has increased exponentially, even beating Moore's law. It has it has gone from few few kilobytes of, of RAM to, to now gigabytes and maybe in petabytes. We are talking data transfer 
uh, through IoT sensors in petabytes, and computers are able to process them very fast, really fast, super fast. And there are there is cloud computing, there is distributed computing, you name it, and computer science has evolved a lot. So uh, two things that is we can kind of um, take out of the equation of the whole thing is speed of the computer and amount of data storage. This is very important because we want to concentrate to solve the problem rather than worry about the speed and storage and the data volume and the traffic that will be going through. Uh, to answer your right. second question, question about what if analysis, uh, yes, uh, we can I have done something similar in, 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 in portfolio management where uh, various portfolios could be created to create a what if analysis using an efficient frontier. Uh, yeah, I mean, what you described can definitely be created through a machine learning algorithm where you can give an employee option to give them the best possible. Uh, so basically, it's how much risk you take to get a better return. So that's what that option can be given through an efficient front frontier. Uh, that's a curve. That's a mathematical equation. Uh, it can be used Very to solve good. that problem. Thank you, Abir. And while we're on this topic, I'm going to throw another question at you. Um, sometimes the sources of data as government organizations that we're mandated to use, we know up front are of, uh, let's say, dubious uh, um, uh, accuracy and confidence level. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, in most states, when a family unit applies for a uh, benefit program, such as uh, TANF, a cash assistance program, or supplemental nutrition, the SNAP uh, program, if there are children involved, then um, the state uh, will route those applications to ensure that the child support agency um, has an existing uh, order in place to ensure that the parent is also meeting their obligation. So as part of that process, if I'm applying online for a, um, a benefit, I then, the system, the agency would then talk to the child support enforcement and submit an order. That was law. Well, because of the social sensitivity around um, benefit applications, we knew that many times the data that would come in from that source would be um, less than optimum. And we would have to spend a good deal of time cleansing that data and requesting additional information in order that, to process the orders that came in from that source. So my question to you is, um, does the technology allow us to manage data from various sources even when we know that data may be uh, compromised uh, from an accuracy standpoint, but we still have value in it, and in some cases are legally mandated to use it. Can you talk about that paradigm a little bit? Yeah, sure, uh, definitely. Uh, so if, if we find that it might not be accurate. We 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 don't want. We might. I have. I have. What I've done recent. I mean, in my previous with my previous clients is, I have used the sentiment of the data rather than the actual value of it. If I feel, and I have always notified it back to the source of the data that uh, there is an issue with the data, and we felt the data have been previously has been like this, but I have provided something else. I need to use it because uh, because that's what the model that's where the model is built on or it's a legal requirement but uh, i think we need to correct this and maybe you can re-execute if you want now sometimes that is possible that might not be possible be but we have a log of it number one number two is how it depends how much we penetrate the data into the model for example irs something uh, tax declaration is legal i might take it i might take it much more seriously than someone who has declared 100k as, a, as their tax liability but in twitter they have they are boasting about 400k as a tax liability. I would use 100k and I would trust IRS data more. But what I would make sure that I also take these tweets and I take the sentiment, yeah, out of it, mm -hmm. because I want to I want to know what's going on here. Someone won't just tweet like that. It could be something else that is coming up and someone has accidentally tweet, tweeted it. So if uh, if it is giving me a value, for example, minus 10 point something, and the data source is not accurate. I would rather take the minus rather than 10 point something because I want to understand the sentiment of it rather than the actual value of it into my model so that I don't contaminate my date, my good data with some bad data um, that is coming in. Rather, okay. and, and sentiment of 
better choice. Very good. Uh, and from a uh, for a layman like myself, um, really the technology can help us. I'm going to use the term uh, massage the data and um, somewhat glean the valuable aspects out of it. And also maybe in a in a strategy or a campaign, um, it can. Um, I'll use the term weight. Uh, it can uh, use a, an appropriate weighting of that uh, data source. So as you said, it doesn't contaminate the outcomes um, significantly. Now, Abir, one of the things that I've heard uh, folks talk about in this particular domain as we talk about analytics is artificial intelligence um, being a tool that is used to help the machine understand the quality of that data and help make decisions on its usage. Is that something that um, you would agree with? And uh, how do you see uh, artificial intelligence uh, playing a role in this uh, strategy? Yeah, sure. Uh, I give an example. If a source of data had few columns in it, uh, what artificial intelligence can do, you, and there is something called feature engineering uh, in, in, in AI, where you can not only uh, use that uh, unreliable data, you can also pick up the missing data and you can even predict some of the values for those missing data. You can, it, might, it might happen that the missing data is statistically significant in the overall model, but you have a lot of missing values in it that might contaminate the other data source. So mm -hmm. before you give it to the main model, you might put a filter in the middle, which would not only look at the data, quality of the data, it, would, it can also predict some of the missing values that is being passed into it. And obviously it can notify it back saying, we are assuming this to be like this because we need to use it. It's a legal requirement, but we need to look at it and we need to find out why this is like this. Very good, very good. Um, uh, one before before we move on, I think we have to just do a time check, uh, Todd and Abir. Yep. And, okay, and uh, yeah, I mean, just one question uh, that I think we have time to take right now, and and I understand a lot of it got covered in the session itself, but uh, one of the panelists, uh, the attendees, basically have asked uh, about what uh, on the uh, on the platform. So they. They want to know that, you know, is this uh, relevant to any specific platform or, uh, you know, do they have to go for any preferred platform here? Uh, Todd or Abir, anybody wants to? Can I, oh. I, I think I, I, I'll take this, Todd, if you're okay with it. Sure, please. absolutely. Cheers, thanks. So, uh, yes, uh, it's a very, uh, you know, uh, nowadays, uh, those those customers who have already gone through some kind of a digital uh, transformation they have a lot of they have inbuilt software already they are working on and it might be possible that the ability to do some machine learning and ai algorithm that platform is already kind of a plug and play for the software that which they are using it will be much easier for them to just just get that component installed in their in their landscape and they can work with it and and they, they are a step closer to uh, to their to their final goal of completely being a digital and transformed organization those companies who have just started their journey in digital journey uh, they can they have a much much better option and choose from they can choose from uh, they can choose from open source they can choose from a proprietary softwares they can even combine both of them and uh, that is very much possible uh, i mean what you what you saw today part of it is 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 open source and part of it is is uh, is licensed software but i can do it everything end to end in open source or i can do it everything end to end in licensed software and it's um, I, I think the options are uh, really growing um uh, vishal in this area because you know as and, and this is happening so rapidly uh, government organizations are, are increasing their adoption rate for cloud so many of their mission critical operations are being conducted in the cloud now. And so one of the challenges has been, okay, how do I take my cloud data from this solution and that solution and be able to perform meaningful analysis on it? And so what, one of the, the advances and literally that's, you know, that's happening to, today um, is the ability for analytics tool sets and platforms to quickly be able to uh, be enabled to ingest data from those cloud solutions and uh, be able to perform enterprise analysis 
uh, regardless of uh, where the solution resides. So um, there really are a lot of options. I would absolutely always recommend uh, bringing in an advisor for a short uh, review to help an organization understand, because really it's hard to, there is no cookie cutter answer to some of these questions. And really you can only determine what's in the best interest of the organization by doing a somewhat detailed review of their uh, situation and their desire uh, moving forward. Absolutely. And I like the part where you said, Todd, that uh, you need an advisor for that. And I would say that the same to everyone here, that uh, please call us. That's what we are here for. <laughs> yeah. And uh, sure. we help you. We will give you the best advice, the best consulting services in the industry when it comes to public sector. Uh, and you saw, you saw the, the content right here. Uh, all of this that you saw today is actually going to be emailed to you by our team uh, tomorrow at the earliest. And uh, we'll also be asking you for a little bit of a feedback and comments uh, on what you felt today and uh, what you want to see next. So we are not stopping here. There are a lot of things to be covered, as you heard from Todd and Abhi today, that this is a vast playing field. And, you know, we probably are just at the, I would say, just a, a, a small portion of it. So we would like to cover as much as we know of and that can help you and the citizens uh, in the government. So um, please. I'll tell you, Vishal, this yeah. is Todd. One of the areas that I'm, I'm very interested in because I know in um, regulatory administration and in many of the government organizations, um, t capability around robotic process automation and the ability for a machine to interrogate content on a form, uh, content in a video file, uh, and make sense of it and make it uh, and turn it into usable information for decision making um, would really be interested in the attendees um, thoughts about use cases for that. I have a ton of them myself that I'm uh, happy to share with folks and have worked with a couple of customers as they engage this area of their technology transformation. Um, and it really folds very nicely into this um, topic. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, I know. I mean, if, if we had even even more time, I think we could have covered more again. But, you know, we have sure. to we will we will uh, uh, limit uh, the webinar here. But again, I mean, thanks everyone for coming. This was a really, really great session, uh, you know, by by the speakers uh, again. Uh, and, you know, we can see that in a lot of attendees joining in and uh, we would see we would like to see more uh, of you. So uh, thank you. Thanks until the next time that we see you. And uh, please send us a feedback and comments. And please re reach out to me on my email ID or my phone that you see here. And we'll be more than happy to answer all your questions. Thank you.